Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right. This episode is the eighth episode of a nine-part series of Uruguayan Wine. These are all free samples, so I have total autonomy in these reviews. Be sure to watch the first episode of this series for a more in-depth feature on Uruguayan wine. The short version is that wine has certainly been made in Uruguay since the early 1600s. However, it's not until about 1870 that the modern wine industry really begins in Uruguay. Today's wine comes from the El Capricho winery in the Durazno department of Uruguay. Now, you might see the word bodega in front of El Capricho, and that's fine, but know that there's a restaurant and slash winery in Spain with the same name. Also, the official name of the company is Surefran S.A. I didn't see El Capricho anywhere on this bottle. However, it looks like it's on their other bottles. This isn't a criticism, this isn't a criticism of anything per se, just that they should probably get the El Capricho name somewhere on this bottle. I'll just double check. Make sure it wasn't hiding on me anywhere. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't see it anywhere where you think it would be on here. Okay, just making sure. Oh, and a couple people gave it 92 points, just so you know. I mean, Tim Atkin, the master of wine, he's kind of somebody. I, I, I know I'm sounding kind of sar sarcastic, but no, he's he's actually a badass. All right, um, <laughs> let's just get, let's move on. All right, so enough of that. Who's behind this wine? Well, it starts with two men, Dirk Renicki and Paul Savio. Dirk is from Germany, and it appears Paul is from Italy. It's in Argentina that they became great friends. As far as their backgrounds, I know Dirk was involved in the financial sector, but I'm uncertain of Paul's background. My guess is that he was also from that sector. Anyway, a couple decades later, they found a 200 hectare estate outside of the town of Villa del Carmen in the Durazno department that already had seven hectares of vineyards. So they bought it. The winery is in the town of Villa del Carmen. While the vineyards had been planted in 2003 and 2004, it wasn't until 2015 that the first vintage of El Capricho was released. The vineyard is planted to Tanat, Cabernet Sauvignon, Verdejo, Pinot Noir, and Tempranillo, oh, and Merlot, in 17 different parcels. Soil is mainly clay. They are actively working towards a sustainable operation. They do manual harvest and all the work in the vineyards done by hand. They have a biodiverse ecosystem with a forest and fruit trees elsewhere on the property near the vineyards. Remember, they got 200 hectares. They use a compost comprised of the following. This is from their website. Uh, the pruning remains are returned to the land between the rows of the vineyard as a natural fertilizer. We plant natural pastures, mostly oats, in between the rows, and they are left to their natural process of decomposing right there to enrich the land. Finally, we use the waste mark from the grapes. This technique served to produce compost for the vineyards. All right, so for any other work in the vineyard, they reduce the use of machinery to help prevent compaction of the soil. This allows the soil to be permeable and draw in water rather than becoming runoff. That could lead to erosion. In addition to the vineyard site, they practice recycling and reusing as much as possible, and they're as energy efficient as possible. Their winemaker is Javier Alegreza from Amanda Barnes' South American Wine Guide website. He is a fourth generation winemaker. He worked for several wineries in Uruguay before, become, before being recruited by El Capricho. He's been their winemaker since the beginning. They have three lines of wines, the Art Collection, the Reserve, and this one, the Aguada Special Reserve. From the South American Wine Guide, this last line is only made in the best vintages and are small production. Now my press kit says there are two wines in this line, this wine in a blend with Tanat, Cab, and Tempranillo, but the winery's website only mentions this one. Aguada translates to will wait, according to Google Translate, but Google Translate also has this to say. Fox-like canid mammal, about 80 centimeters long, very long legs, reddish yellow fur, black on the legs and muzzle, and white at the end of its long tail, lives in humid areas of South America. 
Huh. What do you know? Hence the picture of said animal on the label. I suspected as much, but I wasn't sure. Plus, the press kit also had a, has a bit of marketing fluff about the this elusive fox. Let's get the stats for the wine. The 2018 El Capricho Winery Aguada Tanat Special Reserve. Suggested retail price $55. From Drasno, 100% Tanat, hand harvested. Yield is 5,000 kilograms per hectare. That translates to 2.02 tons per acre. Cold fermentation, oak aging, 18 months, new French oak. No percentage given, so maybe 100%. I mean, it's not an, it's not an inexpensive wine by any means. Bottle aging is 12 months. ABV is 14%. The total acidity is 3.8 grams per liter. Residual sugar is 2 grams per liter. The production is 1,700 bottles. Yeah, bottles, not cases. All right, let's get into the wine. All right, a $55 bottle of Tanat. First of all, you know, I've had higher end Tanat or, or, or higher, you know, more expensive Tanat. Or, or sorry, not more expensive. I've had Tanat in this kind of price range, but like from Texas. So um, interesting to see what their $55 Tanat is going to be like. Low production. I mean, in reality, this place is kind of middle of nowhere. Though you can say that with some of the other wines we had in this, in this series. You know, where it's like, in like, you know, Rivetta, I think, you know, it's one of only a few vineyards at all. And it's like almost in Brazil. So, I mean, yeah. Now, when I was trying to find a vineyard for this, for this one, um, they, they weren't like super vague, but they were kind of vague. But honestly, uh, I can't remember if it's on, you know, it's on their tech sheet. It says vineyard located at, and I find that in Europe, the same thing happens. They'll give you like the mile marker. <laughs> like you're supposed to know where that is. Like the maps, at least the maps I use, don't put mile markers necessarily on the map. Anyway, I found it, but that's on the, it's on the Western side of the town. On the Eastern side, there's a town called Carmen. So you have Via del Carmen and you have Carmen. And so Carmen's on the East, which that's this, the, this east is your, from your perspective, east is over here. So there's another vineyard, and it's about the same distance from Carmen as their vineyard is from Via del Carmen. Anyway, but you I mean, looking at everything and seeing how the two differences between the two, between the two plots of land, it's obvious that the one I showed you is the right one. All righty. So 100% Tanat. Now, this one does have a little bit of, I can see a little bit through, like at the edge. Uh, on the on the top here, um, there is a little bit of orange coloration. Now, what, what was that? What was this? Nineteen, eighteen. All right, so four, four and a half years. Really, I mean, it's it's January, so we're not quite to five years uh, from harvest. That's going to be in a couple months that they'll be doing harvest again. But I mean, four and a half years, a touch of orange, so maybe a little bit of oxidation. Though, I mean, with the high amounts of tannin in Tanat, I don't know how long it takes for you to start seeing a color change. Call it medium intensity of aromas. I wouldn't call it youthful. I wouldn't necessarily call it like necessarily developing, developing, but I know this is, you know, we're getting close to five years on this, but it doesn't smell like youthful. But then again, nothing really is coming out of the, uh, on the, on the uh, aromas here on the bouquet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just smells like wine right now. So, a little bit of black fruit. That's about it. Yeah, and I don't have, like, any of the obvious new oak aromas. Maybe it just needs to open up some. I don't know. But let's taste it. It's one of those wines that's all in the palate. So, lots of fruit and very ripe on the fruit, almost jammy, black and red fruit. So blackberry, black raspberry, raspberry. I don't really get any strawberry on this one, but those, those fruits in a kind of a jammy type of thing. Um, I made a comment on one of the other wines about taking a cracker and some cheese and some, and some meat and putting the jam on there. Take away the meat. 
Um, you can put a little bit of cheese on there, but it's really like it's really like just the crackers and the and the and the the jam. Um, maybe you have like maybe it's I don't know. Maybe it's like a toast. You know, buttered buttered toast. It's on, but you don't really have any. I don't taste the butter. It's just like eating jam. But I just have this sensation of it's on something, some type of bread product. There's a good amount of cinnamon going on here. A little bit of vanilla clove, but more cinnamon than anything else. There's a there's the, the heat coming through on the alcohol is is kind of present, um, so that helps with that cinnamon or red hot type of thing going on. So yeah, there's new oak influence here. I don't know how much was new oak and how much was first, second, third year, third use oak. Cause it just says new oak and 18 months. So I would expect more on the palette coming from new oak, but I would say there's, I would say there is oak on the wine, but it feels more restrained old world style. Uh, restraint of oak. With that said, it's very fruit forward. I get a little bit of that um, potpourri, more of a lavender thing going on. Um, you get some like earthiness, a little herbaceousness from it. It's really a closed wine for me. It's 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 not showing like I think everything it should. Um, it could just be in a phase. So. I don't really talk about this very often and I've kind of alluded to this in the whole series of wines that you now it's like now I'm at the almost the very end. Now I'm going to bring this up. Wines sometimes go through phases. Um, they go through times where they're more expressive and other times where they're not as expressive. Um, and this might be in that this might be in that. I can tell that there's great structure to it. Uh, the flavors are good. I mean, I feel there's a complexity that's just waiting to come through. I feel like there's stuff that's just like saying, just give me a chance. It's coming. But it could also be just a, um, a situation with, as I just totally splashed on my glasses here. Um, it could be totally a situation where... Um, it just needs more time or needs more air. Oh, now, now I got all kinds of just junk on my, my glasses here. Oh, I haven't had one of these over here, but yeah, it could be just one of those things where it just needs more, more aeration because that just, that last sip there, I feel like I'm getting a little more complexity on it. So it could just, it just needs maybe a little time. And that's where sometimes with wine reviews, when you're only giving it maybe a truly like five to 10 minutes worth of, of tasting that, um, it may not be the most fair way to taste some wines. I mean, it tastes really good. There's a seriousness to this wine. I mean, there's a, oh man, the tannin really just ripped through right now. Oh, wow. I mean, I feel like as I taste each tasting or each, you know, each taste, I'm getting more and more complexity. So I think this is a wine that you could decant. <laughs> Certainly you could decant this wine and probably let it decant for like four hours. Like, you could probably decant it in the morning before to, before you go to work, come back, it'd probably be perfect. So I think this is a wine that kind of needs some more time in the glass or to open up in a decanter type of thing. Every sip seems to bring more complexity um, to it. And the tannin just like kind of went over the top real quick. Yeah, I'm getting more meat to it. I'm getting more... Um, I'm getting more spice characteristics, more spice rack type of stuff. It's it's building. I like to see where this wine would be in a couple more hours, but we don't have that kind of time. Anyway, I think it has great potential. It is fifty-five dollars if you can find it, and you've got a spare double nickel in in your wallet. There, splurge. You know, take care of yourself. Give it a shot. I would decant it though. Absolutely, decant it for at least an hour, um, so that you can really give it its best shot of just totally shining. And I think it will do that. I also think it could age. Like, I think this could age 10, 20 years, if not longer. Um, I mean, most of the red wines I have, I think can show a little bit of ageability, but this one and then the Garzon, the, the single vineyard, I think they both could age, but I think this one could age for a couple decades with no problem.
All right, that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time.